U.S. President Joe Biden drops out of the U.S. presidential race. President Joe Biden announced he's ending his campaign and will not seek re-election in November. Draft orders have been issued to ultra-Orthodox men in Israel. Some of Netanyahu's ultra-Orthodox coalition partners say they will pull out of the government, which could bring down Netanyahu's coalition. And it's been 55 years since humans first walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Today is Monday, July 22nd, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Scott Walterman. Bonsoir à tous. Édition spéciale consacrée au retrait de la candidature de Joe Biden. C'est un coup de tonnerre aux États-Unis. That's a broadcast from French television as the news that U.S. President Joe Biden announces he's dropping out of the presidential election runs across the world. Four years ago, as he ran for the White House, Biden saw himself as a one-term president, a savvy conduit from the chaotic years of Donald Trump to a new generation of democratic leaders. Look, I view myself as a bridge, not as anything else. There's an entire generation of leaders you saw stand behind me. They are the future of this country. Well, that was Biden at a campaign event in March 2020 with a group of much younger politicians vying to be his running mate, including Kamala Harris, who ultimately got the nod. It was widely seen as his main mission, dislodge Trump from the White House, then bow out with elegance after one term. Biden, who is now 81 years old, will indeed be a one-term president, but under tumultuous circumstances, long simmering worries about his age and mental sharpness have exploded to doom him when he decided to go for that second term after all. Joining us now to give us some details of what's happening at the White House is VOA's White House Bureau Chief, Patsy Wadakaswara. What do we know of the um, decision process that led to this announcement? Well, one, we know that he has been under extreme pressure from leading Democrats as well as ordinary Americans. Over the weekend on Saturday, there was a small demonstration in front of the White House demanding that President Joe Biden pass the torch. More than 25 lawmakers, Democratic lawmakers, have asked him or have conveyed their concerns publicly about the viability of his candidacy. And President Joe Biden himself has been mulling over this uh, in his vacation home in Delaware since Thursday when he was when it was found out that he had a, a positive COVID diagnosis. This was kind of expected, but it was also sort of a surprise. I mean, a, a large part of the Washington political circle have been speculating that he might announce it this weekend. Um, but Nobody knew for sure until it happened. Do you think that he's going to address the nation and, and make a speech to the American people? Yes, he has promised that he would do so. He said he will speak more about his decision more in detail sometimes this coming week. Now, in his um, announcement, he also endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris to uh, pick up the torch uh, in the race. Even though... Joe Biden said that he offered his full support and endorsement for Harris to be the party's nominee. Politically, even though this is meaningful, technically the process will not be determined by Biden or Harris. It will be determined by the delegates who are scheduled to meet at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, Illinois, next month on August 19th. Because the way American democracy works, it's not that one man, one votes in the polling booth and then whoever gets the most votes wins. The American people vote in what's called primaries and caucuses. And then the the candidate who gets the most votes, uh, they will be determined by the delegates choosing or pledging their vote to that uh, candidate in the their respective national convention. And Democrats are set to meet next month. So even though Biden have said that he endorses Harris, it's not automatic, it's not legally automatic um, that that uh, will be, you know, the, the guaranteed step forward for Democrats, particularly if there are other candidates between now and the convention that says that they are also interested to be the party's nominee. White House Bureau Chief Patsy Wadakaswara. 
Harris, America's first-ever female vice president, could be nominated to take the top spot on the Democratic Party ticket for President of the United States. Senior Washington correspondent Carolyn Persuti looks back at Harris's roots and her past four years in office. Please raise your right hand. A history-making moment in the United States in 2021. So help me God. As former Senator Kamala Harris became the nation's first female vice president. It is my honor to be here, to stand on the shoulders of those who came before. Harris is also the first black American and Indian American to serve in the nation's second highest job. She's broken so many glass ceilings for so many women. The daughter of an Indian mother and a Jamaican father, Harris was born in Oakland, California. A mural of her appears at the school she was bused to as a child as part of racial integration efforts. A graduate of Howard University, Harris became the first female district attorney in San Francisco in 2004. And then in 2011, the first black woman to serve as California's attorney general. During her years as vice president, Harris has been vocal about the U.S. Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade, a 1973 decision that had made abortion legal nationwide. During his term, former President Donald Trump appointed three conservative justices to the high court. He proudly, he uses the word proudly, takes credit for overturning Roe. So make no mistake, if Trump gets the chance, he will sign a national abortion ban to outlaw abortion in every single state. The vice president also applauds continuation of the Affordable Care Act and the reduced price of insulin achieved by the Biden administration. Raise your hand if you have a family member with diabetes. Early on, she was tapped to lead the administration's efforts at the border. But the Biden campaign ended up on defense, with immigration a key issue in the 2024 election. Now undocumented spouses of American citizens who have been in the country for 10 or more years can stay in the country while they apply for a green card. Speaking to pro-immigrant groups like the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, she quickly turns the focus to Donald Trump's words. That someone who vilifies immigrants who promotes xenophobia, someone who stokes hate, should never again have the chance to stand behind a microphone and the seal of the President of the United States. Harris has become more present at rallies like these on the campaign trail after President Joe Biden's stumbling performance in the June debate with former President Donald Trump. We beat Trump once and we're gonna beat him again, period. With President Biden's withdrawal from the race on Sunday, if Harris is nominated, she would again make history as the first black and Indian American woman to run for the nation's highest office. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. Carolyn Persuti, VOA News. Now, there was also a political element to all of this. Even though Biden gave the endorsement to Vice President Harris, it doesn't mean she will automatically become the nominee. So let's dig into that. Joining us now to talk about that aspect of the story is Charles Chamberlain from Chamberlain PR. He served as a spokesman and communications strategist for three U.S. senators and a speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. So let's start at the top. Uh, Not a surprise, but still nonetheless, if not um, shocking, unsettling maybe? I mean, if you're a traditionalist and you're someone that has watched politics or followed politics for the last I don't know, 50, 40 years, uh, you're, this, does, this makes absolutely no sense to you. I mean, I think, I, I think I feel, I, I've been involved in politics for almost uh, 20 years, for over 20 years, and I'm one of those guys that kind of follows traditions and people are telling me, you know, Biden's going to, she should drop out or he's going to drop out and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's never going to happen. And I just didn't think that something like this could happen this day and age because of the, the political apparatus that you have to set up, the funding, the, the, the modeling for opposition research and the, 
and the and the staff being in place and the beliefs behind it, it takes all this to coalesce behind one candidate. It's, it's a lot. I mean, it, when you win, I don't care if you're 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 looking at Clinton, you're looking at W. Bush, uh, Bush forty one. You know, you, it's just it takes a tremendous amount of people coming together to get behind a candidate to actually win. And to do that in a matter of a day or even a couple weeks before the I think it's three weeks before the DNC convention, it just seems improbable. Um, but here we are. Here we are. A lot of people always talk about the money um, because she's part of the campaign. She can access the funds. Can you explain all that to us? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, according to the, to the rules that like if it's not as if one candidate can transfer money to another candidate. Um, it just that's not the the way the, and the the rules work. But because she's on the ticket, um, the Biden Harris ticket. Uh, it, it stays the same. Like, oh, I think she just filed with the SEC today. So by uh, uh, Biden for president just became Harris for president. Um, that I think that changed a little over an hour and a half ago. Um, so all uh, officially as of right now, Biden for uh, president is Harris for president. So all that's changing over all the legalities behind it. It just, it works. And so what, this is why Kamala Harris as for president for the Democratic Party makes the most sense. Now, they're not, you know, the the time for coyness is over. I understand that they've been making calls to delegates at the convention, yeah. getting them on board. Yeah, and look, they've got the upper hand. It's not as if some sort of delegate list, contact list, or or modeling exists, right? You got to, if you want to become president right now, you got to seek out every delegate that exists. It's a or 4,000 or something like that. And Biden has them all. So they've got a huge upper hand when it comes to that and they can make the calls and they can get folks to coalesce. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly what they should be doing right now. Well, they've so, had yeah, a couple of weeks. Like this has been in, this has been in the works for a couple of weeks now. This isn't coming. I mean, you right I, after he I, made the announcement, there were 40 press releases that were launched I I instantaneously. I can't say that. The reason why I can't say that as a longtime communications person, nobody, it just made the Democrats look disorganized, right? This is, this is the, akin to the Republicans in the House, like not being able to secure a speaker, right? Um, it sure. just, nobody wants that kind of damage, political damage. And here's the thing. Kamala Harris, vice president, she's collateral damage because she's the vice president, right? She's sitting there while all this is happening. And yeah, sure, it's not her fault. But now you've got people talking about, you know, was she aware of the of, of the president's mental condition or health? Um, you know, did she know that he wasn't fit for office? And, you know, Republicans are already beginning to tie her to all the chaos that existed ahead of what happened today. Well... It's not boring. <laughs> but that's the thing. And that's why this is, look, I do not think that Biden intended for this to happen. I think, and I, uh, there was a New York Times article that just came out uh, today that basically said he, over the last three weeks, he was trying to beat back all the stories. And then on Saturday, he finally gave up. He's like, because he had finally told folks, look, I, he was telling folks, I'm running, I'm in it to win it. And but nobody was taking that for an answer because there weren't people standing behind them. It isn't so much as to what Pelosi, uh, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi is saying. It's what she's not saying. It's what uh, former President Barack Obama is not saying. It's about what the current Speaker, uh, the current uh, minority leader is not saying. They weren't saying, hey, full-throated, we're behind them and we're, we're moving forward. Uh, and after all that kind of pressure mounted, he... He 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 had to bow up, hmm. and so I think this is all this is all a function of uh, that kind of chaos happening, and the media wanting to report on it. it you, you, this is a sexy story, uh, you know. When a when a political party is in chaos, when a person's too old to be fit for office, and they're stumbling in their words, and they're tripping and falling, you're 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 uh, you're, you're calling. 
I think he missed he called someone Putin wasn't supposed to be called Putin the other day. This is just I mean, it, it's, it's just ripe for stories. Well, it is the story. Exactly. Yeah. Charles Chamberlain. Exactly. Thank you so very much for your time and your insight. No problem. Charles Chamberlain from Chamberlain PR. Now, the last time an incumbent president did not seek re-election was in 1968. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson made the surprise announcement during a televised address to the nation from the Oval Office. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. The news that President Johnson chose not to seek re-election was shocking to many people at the time. Like now, there was a huge division in the country. The Vietnam War was raging, campus unrest was at its height with the anti-war movement, and civil rights created a vast regional split in the nation. President Johnson also addressed that in that same speech. It is true that a house divided against itself by the spirit of faction, of party, of region, of religion, of race, is a house that cannot stand. That was U.S. President Lyndon Johnson in 1968 telling the American people he would not seek re-election. So recapping the news from Sunday, U.S. President Joe Biden announced he will drop out of the race for the presidency. We expect that he will also address the nation on television and radio sometime this week, which we will bring you here on The Voice of America when it happens. We're following these other stories from around the world. 20,000 protesters hit the streets of Palma in Mallorca Sunday for a mass demonstration against over-tourism, demanding changes to a touristic model they say is harming that Spanish Mediterranean island. At least two people have been killed in Ukrainian strikes on the partly Russian-occupied Donetsk region. That, according to Russian state media, Ukraine authorities report that Russian strikes wounded at least five people in Ukraine overnight. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, will be heading to Washington on Monday to make a politically precarious speech before a joint session of Congress. The visit comes at a time with great uncertainty following U.S. President Joe Biden's withdrawal from the presidential race. The Israeli army on Sunday sent out its first batch of a thousand draft orders to ultra-Orthodox men in a move that could threaten the Israeli government. The move came after the Israeli Supreme Court said their exemption from service was illegal. Linda Granstein reports for VOA from Jerusalem. A total of 3,000 draft orders will be sent to men who the Army believes are not engaged in full-time study. The original exemption from armed service was for ultra-Orthodox Jews who are studying Jewish texts full-time and believe that their prayer and study contribute to Israeli society. Several prominent ultra-Orthodox rabbis have urged their students to ignore the draft orders, which could lead to their arrest. Moshe Roth, an ultra-Orthodox lawmaker, says he does not believe many ultra-Orthodox men will eventually serve. It's more of a declaration more than anything else. It doesn't add anything to the defense uh, issue at, at, at this time. Israeli army officials disagree. They say there is a shortfall of at least 6,000 soldiers in the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Many Israelis say it is also a matter of principle and the court decision is meant to provide greater equality. Israeli Jewish men serve for two years and eight months and women for two years. Arab citizens of Israel are not drafted, although some do volunteer. Until the Supreme Court ruling last month, some 63,000 ultra-Orthodox Jews received automatic exemptions from service. Some ultra-Orthodox rabbis worry that contact with secular Israeli society may prompt at least some of the ultra-Orthodox to leave their religion. Ariel Kellner of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party 
said he understands the army's need for more soldiers. But we are also committed that the Haredim, that the ultra-Orthodox community will feel comfortable in the army. The men who received the draft orders have two weeks to report to the induction center to begin the process. Some of Netanyahu's ultra-Orthodox coalition partners say they will pull out of the government, which could bring down Netanyahu's coalition. Other Israeli analysts say that as long as the number remains small, the ultra-Orthodox parties will not leave the government. Linda Gradstein, VOA News, Jerusalem. Bangladesh's Supreme Court on Sunday scrapped most of the quotas on government jobs that had sparked nationwide protest by students that have killed at least 114 people in recent days. Reuters correspondent Sean Hogan has more on this. Bangladesh Attorney General A.M. Amin Adeem said the jobs should be open to candidates on merit. The Supreme Court's appellate division, according to Article 104, gave a final solution to this quota system. That is 93% quota for general people. 5% quota for freedom fighters and their kin, 1% for ethnic minority community, and 1% for third gender and physically disabled. Nationwide unrest sparked following student anger against the quotas that included reserving 30% of government positions for families of those who fought for independence from Pakistan. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government scrapped the quota in 2018, but the lower court reinstated it last month. A dean told Reuters by phone that protesting students had said they were not involved in violence and the government would find those responsible for it. Witnesses said that the capital of Dhaka's streets were quiet following the decision after local media had reported scattered clashes earlier in the day. Demonstrations have also been fuelled by high unemployment among young people, who make up nearly a fifth of the population. Military were patrolling with army checkpoints set up as the government had extended a curfew while bracing for the judgment. Internet and text message services in Bangladesh have been suspended since Thursday, cutting the nation's 170 million people off as police cracked down on protesters who defied a ban on public gatherings. Bangladeshis trying to leave the country crowded outside an airline office in Dhaka on Sunday. Mohammed Kosa told Reuters he was trying to return to Saudi Arabia. His flight was cancelled and a new one cost him over $200. He says if he is stuck in Bangladesh for two more days, he will need to beg in the streets. Local media reported the curfew was to resume for an uncertain time after a two-hour break for people to gather supplies. Reuters correspondent Sean Hogan. International Edition continues. I'm Scott Walterman. And finally... That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong, July 20th, 1969, standing on the surface of the moon. The first human to do so. Those words, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, endure as one of the best-known quotes in the English language. This past weekend was the 55th anniversary of the first moon landing. Nearly one-fifth of the world's population had skipped work or defied sleep to watch the astronauts' first exploration of the moon. It happened at 2.52 a.m. GMT, July 21, 1969. Years later, Armstrong tried to put the event into perspective. The important uh, achievement of of Apollo was a demonstration that humanity is not forever chained to this planet and our our, our visions go rather further than that and our opportunities are unlimited. To date, spacecraft from just four other countries have ever landed on the moon, the former Soviet Union, China, India, and most recently, just last month, Japan. The United States is still the only one ever to have sent humans 
to the lunar surface. This has been International Edition on the Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thank you so much for being with us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walter.